Uh, today, if you would mind, grab your Bibles and go to the New Testament, to the book of John. We're going to be jumping into God's Word. I know it's a few days away, but I just want to say a very merry, 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 merry Christmas to you all. Happy Christmas, Merry Christmas, joyful Christmas. Um, it's with great anticipation that we come to this time of year. I know I love it, even though it's a super busy time and stressful time, but it's the moment we get to celebrate and think back to the birth of Jesus Christ, Him coming into this world. And uh, it's a miracle. Christmas is a miracle. So hopefully your holiday is filled with joy. I um, want to just off the bat ask you, have you noticed, I don't know if there's any folks here who are very, very in tune with all the carols that are sung during Christmas time. You know, there's a lot of Christmas carols that we sing. And there is a common theme or a, a, a familiar theme in many of them, and that is this theme about light. There's light being referenced all over the place. What about this one here? Uh, oh, silent night, silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright. What about, oh, little town of Bethlehem? There's a phrase tucked in there that goes something like this. It says, in thy dark streets shineth the everlasting light. Or what about this one? Angels from the realm of glory, yonder shines the infant light. And so on and so forth. Several carols have this connection with light. And we've brought in this theme and connection here into our service this morning. You've noticed this month we've had Christmas trees up here on the platform, and uh, there are lights that are adorned on these trees. Now, there may be a few people here who are super, super spiritual. You guys are way more spiritual than maybe even I am, and so, you know, I give you kudos, but you might say to me, Pastor Brian, I don't agree with this whole Christmas tree stuff. I don't, I don't believe that. Christmas trees, pagan practice, no, not for me. And so, okay, I hear you out, but just before you cancel me or the rest of the other Christian brothers and sisters who at this very moment in their homes have a Christmas tree erected with lights, okay, before you cancel us, let me just say this. Think about Martin Luther. Martin Luther, back in the Reformation in, in the 1600s, he's actually credited with starting this tradition of putting decorating lights on Christmas trees. See, the beauty of the starlit evergreen trees outside of his home would often cause him a lot of joy. He would just stop and pause and contemplate on those lights uh, as the light shimmered off the evergreens. So one night as he's coming home, he's in the middle of, of like thinking through a sermon idea. He catches the brilliance of stars twinkling on these evergreens. So it creates in him an idea. In hopes to recapture that moment and what he saw, he decides, I'm going to cut one of these trees down. I'm going to take it into my home, erect it in the main room. I will wire its branches with candlelights. And then he went and brought his family in. In bringing his family in, he looked at those flickering lights upon those evergreen branches and he taught something to his kids. He said, children, this is to be a reminder to you of what Jesus did. If Jesus would not have come into this world, this world would be in eternal darkness. But having come, as announced by the angel, and we've been looking at it here in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Having come, kids, our faith in Jesus can remain fresh even in times of trouble. Our faith in Christ stays evergreen even though there are sorrows. It stays bright even in the midst of despair. And can somebody say amen to that? So this morning in anticipation for Christmas, that'll be happening later on in this week, I just want us to continue in this message series of Emmanuel, you know, and talk about Emmanuel in the darkness. We've talked Emmanuel in the valleys. We looked at the Psalms and realized the main idea there that no matter how much we may enjoy God in the mountain peaks, we get to experience Him intimately in the valleys. 
in the valley of Baca, the valley of tears. We looked at God in the storm in Acts chapter 27 where we saw Paul in the midst of a storm in a tragedy and there we realized that the presence of a storm does not cancel out the presence of God. Amen. And today, there's no real big idea in the sense of we're going to have a pithy statement or a a succinct sentence that we're going to look back and say that's that. What I just want to focus on today is Emmanuel in the darkness. Who is God with us? What is this God with us? Who is this person? And so let's consider a scripture. We'll look at a few, but we're considering one. Are you in John chapter one? Say amen. Amen. And we're going to begin there. I like John's gospel, okay? And we're going to start here today as opposed to going to Luke chapter 2 and all these other places we can go for Christmas. I like it that John starts here. He goes back and takes us back to the beginning where Christmas truly began. Matthew, he begins his gospel and going through the genealogy of Jesus. Mark skips the whole birth scene and genealogy and goes right to uh, the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan River. Luke takes us on the angelic visitations and all that happened, you know, as angels showed up to Zacharias, Joseph, and Mary. But John takes us back to the real beginning. He takes us back before Bethlehem. He takes us back before the conception. He takes us back before the pregnancy, before time and space, all the way back to in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God, John says, the word already existed. He was with God and he was God and he was in the beginning with God. He created everything there is. Nothing exists that he did not make. Life itself was in him, and his life gives light to everyone. The light shines through the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. God sent John John the Baptist to tell everyone about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was only a witness to the light. And here is our verse, verse 9. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was to come into the world. Father, I thank you for your word. In this Christmas season, as we anticipate your arrival, Father, I pray that your word would speak to us in the midst of our valley, in the midst of our storm, in the midst of our darkness, in the midst of our victories. In Jesus' name, amen. Sometimes we we go into the Christmas season and there's a lot of things on our minds that have nothing to do with Jesus. Can I relate to anybody? Okay, what are some of the things that are on your mind this Christmas holiday season? Cookies. Oh, hallelujah, cookies. Okay, all right, cookies. Someone went, you know, a little bit more, you know, substantive over here. Job, is that what I heard? Shopping. Okay, shopping. I was wrong. Okay, shopping. Family, what else? Food, Ah, a lot of food, absolutely. Wrapping gifts, um, parties and get-togethers and stress of taking time off before you lose it at the end of the year. No rollover at work or rollovers, yes, but I'll lose some. Whatever it is, there's a lot of humbug, a lot of things, a lot of business, a lot of things vying for our attention. And we have the traditional scene that we take a look at at this Christmas season, the nativity scene. And we might see it displayed in different places. We ourselves might see pictures of it online or, you know, send greeting cards that have it and all that different stuff. And we'll see in that scene Joseph and Mary cuddling a little baby. A baby in their arms, lost in the wonder and amazement of having that child that was promised. You know, I'll find myself doing this in the busyness of Christmas and, you know, all this other stuff. I'll find myself distracted. But here's the thing. I can relate to Mary and Joseph being caught up in that little child. I'll often sometimes just, you know, stop everything I'm doing and just look at my little boy. And I'm just like amazed and awe and wonder looking at this little kid that I love so much and I'm entrusted to take care of. You know, there's moments where uh, I'll, I'll say, forget what I'm doing, and I'll start running and chasing him around the house because he can walk and run now. And it'll usually end up with me, like, smothering him, trying to tickle and kiss him and all that kind of stuff, and him trying to fight me away. 
I can get caught up in the amazement and wonder of that little child. And I, I can see Mary and Joseph being caught up in that moment. And we, we have this image of Christmas, a baby in a manger, a child, you know, amongst the animals and, you know, coming into a humble circumstance and situation. We have that mental image but when we stop and we realize beyond the, the original splendor or the immediate implications of that child right there, who is this baby? When we stop and realize the wonder and amazement of who truly is this child in this manger, I feel like the wonder just grows exponentially. It goes up a hundredfold. Who is this child in the manger? In John chapter 1, it says, it is the Word. The Word. He is the one that had life in himself. See, this is the first person. This is the person that, you know, be, um, prior to having been born, he existed. That's not the case with my son. Prior to having been born, he didn't, he wasn't born, <laughs> you know? There, there needed to be things coming together so that he was able to be formed in the miracle of life. But the only person who ever existed before he was born was Jesus Christ. And it says, his light has come. One of the things that I've hoped and I prayed for for this year and as we've transitioned and all this stuff that's been going on in the midst of a pandemic and all that is for us to be continuously growing in our journey with Jesus. My heart for you is that you would be continuously growing a little bit bigger and bigger than you previously were in your relationship with Jesus. You might have issues, you might have problems, you might have medical problems, financial problems, difficulties, whatever it might be that seems so large and so impossible, but in the midst of it all, I'm not trying to minimize those things. What I want you to understand, despite how enormous they might be, that God is bigger. And the child that came into the manger was bigger than just a child in the room and in the family. It was way bigger because he was the word that was pre-existent. Amen? And so today I want you to understand it like this. Let me, let me transition. Anybody here ever see the Chronicles of Narnia or you read the books? by C.S. Lewis. You know, we got a couple of different books and some of them follow a certain storyline with a group of kids. There's a scene in that uh, book series where Lucy sees the lion. She sees Aslan, the lion, and the lion represents in that story Jesus Christ. And there's a moment where she sees him after a while. She gazes up and he says, welcome child. And Lucy says, Aslan, you're bigger. Aslan, you're bigger. And Aslan says, that's because you're older, little one. You mean, I'm, you're not bigger? Really? That's not it? And he says, no, I'm not. But every year that you grow, you will find me bigger. And that idea, I think, is so true. As we grow, we have to grow from this concept. You know, we've come into this realization and introduction of Jesus Christ in a manger. The baby, the babe is born in that man. But we need to, as we grow, as we grow in life, as we grow, so should our spiritual life grow as well. So should our perception of who Jesus is grow as well. And as we grow and become more and more aware of who Christ is, that he grew up, he's not just a little baby anymore. But he grew up and he did some things. He grew up and he said some things. He grew up and he fulfilled some things. And because he did that, he went all the way to the cross. And on that cross, he died. And then he rose from the grave. And he's alive right now. And he will come back one day. And that is the miracle of Christmas that we celebrate. So as an act of faith, why don't you just give God a praise right now in this moment. And say, God, thank you. Because you did not just remain a child in a manger, but you grew up to say and do and establish and fulfill some things, amen? So let's take a look at the verse and break down a few things. I don't have major, you know, ground-breaking ideas for you to consider today. I just want you to fall in love with the babe in the manger and who he truly is, what he's grown up to be inside of your heart and life, the potential that it holds today. So the verse once again, the one who is the true light, said John, who gives light to everyone was going to come into the world. 
First thing I want you to just understand here today as we get into this series and look around at what's happening is the fact that uh, he is Emmanuel in the darkness. Emmanuel is reliable. That here is a God, is a child in a manger who is reliable. John said, this is the true light. The word true here implies that there has to be something that is of veracity and something that is not. There must be true light, effective light, genuine light, and there has to be false lights, lights that are not and cannot and have no power. And therefore, if we look into our world, church, do we not understand that there are some false lights around? Not all that glitters is gold, as the expression goes. There are some false lights and false ways and false ideas. There are some false systems and false, you know, desires and things that might even show up, but they lead us down something that is broken, that is not effective and efficient, that does not bring us joy and true lasting um, satisfaction. And every year as we realize that there are false promises in the world, Every generation, generation to generation, the world seems to get darker and darker, does it not? See, in world history, there's even a period of time that's been labeled the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages was a time period in European medieval history that spanned from 476 to about 800 um, years. And there was so much violence in Europe, so much war, so much turmoil, and all those different things. And if we stop and we contemplate and juxtapose those two time periods, that time period to today, not much has changed. Some details have been shifted, but we still have wars. We still have challenges. We still have calamity. We still have uh, violence. We still have depravity. We still have all these different things. And that's still proliferating into this time period today. And if we look at the history lessons and the books, and we get the numbers and break things down, we'll realize that there have been more people killed in violence and in war in this past century than all those other centuries combined. If we look at the wars and different things, the world we live in is dark. But back in the early 1900s, there was this idea and optimism that was rising that one day we're going to get to this golden age. Some, you know, sociologists and social evolutionists, these guys were telling us that we're getting better and better, becoming smarter and smarter, that we are becoming more and more enlightened, and we will get to this place where we have the light. And what's happened to that idea? What's happened to that? If we stop and think about this, World War I happened to it. World War II happened to it. The Vietnam War happened to it. The AIDS epidemic happened to it. The nuclear proliferation happened to it. September 11th has happened to it. And it's gone on and on. And the record shows school shootings has happened to it. And all these different things has happened to it. And so you stop and you wonder, is this world becoming more and more light? Or is it all false hopes and false answers, false systems and different things. But John tells us the one who is the true light has come. His name is Jesus. He was the word who was before the beginning. He came before time itself and he is a true light in the sense that he is being real and genuine in contrast to all that is fanciful, to all that is attempting to be a fake light or provide an answer and a solution. I just bring this because I know that God has embedded inside of, of, of his word and throughout history. He's given us the real deal where he is not just a flicker. We see it from the beginning of time when man first committed the error in the garden that God was true and genuine and started making a plan. Amen. And he made that plan, he weaved that thread all throughout the scriptures, all throughout history, bringing in through a span of all these years, through different authors, he recorded the record of that history, and he's given us his word that he came in the fullness of time, and he fulfilled his plan, the ultimate self-disclosure of God. That was Jesus. He is genuine. He is true. He is the one that was to come and is, and he has arrived. And so... I want us to just stop and frame this. He was reliable. 
He is reliable. And how many of us have been in life's storms, in life's valleys, in the midst of darkness, and we realize we might go for a light source. We might go for something that would give us some hope and some assurance or some peace. How many of us have come to a place in a moment where that peace, that source of comfort, whatever it is that we were leaning upon and depending upon, it's failed us? Anybody? I hate it when I'm in the middle of the night and I need to go somewhere and, uh, you know, I don't want to turn the lights on because I might wake up Micah or my wife or whatever, got to go to the bathroom or get some water, and then I grab my phone because I don't want to turn the lights on. I grab my cell phone, but I forgot to plug it in. I turn on the flashlight app and I'm in the middle of going somewhere and all of a sudden the light goes out. And the next thing I know, I'm bumping into something and what I did not want to happen is happening that I'm actually causing a ruckus, making noise, and I end up waking them up anyways. That light that I depended upon was not genuine. It was not there when I needed it to be there. And so Jesus Christ is the only light, John says, the true light of the world. And he goes on to say this, Jesus, in his ministry, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will never walk in darkness. So this morning, this Christmas season, I don't know what your struggle is, your situation, your challenge, but I just want you to realize that the light that has come into the world, the baby that came into the manger, he was a reliable light, a reliable, dependable, genuine, genuine source of comfort, hope, and a future. The second thing I want you to take a look at is Emmanuel in the darkness, he is sufficiently inclusive. This sufficiently inclusive comes out of this idea where he says, the one who is the true light who gives light to everyone. I want you to think about that. God gives light to everyone. It does not say to some people, to a specific group, to this classification or that cultural uh, heritage. It doesn't say from this geographical region, he gives light to everyone. And I truly believe that God does everything plainly, inherently put inside of man this knowledge of himself. As we've read before in Ecclesiastes, he's hidden eternity in our hearts. I believe that. Paul talks about how he puts his revelation even within creation in Romans chapter 1, that God's given us general revelation. And so we see these things. It's in our consciousness, in nature. It's in different areas of morality. And when we study things, we realize that there has to be a God that is trying to reveal himself to us. He's giving light to everyone. But what is intended when John wrote here, God that gives light to everyone? The verb fotese, gives light, has a primary meaning here to say this, to shed light upon, to make visible, to bring light upon, onto something. And so when we stop and look at this, uh, some people have connected this idea that gives light to everyone is this idea of enlightenment inside of the person. That we've gone on this journey and we can recognize God in our minds and, you know, we can ascend to a specific... All right, there could be inner illumination that God has given us. He's embedded in our hearts, but that is not the scope of this scripture. Whether it's general revelation or special and specific that God intends to affect salvation inside of us. What John is talking about here is something different. The light that's come into the world is like this. If you take a light in a dark spot and you turn on that light, that light will affect every space within that dark room. It will shine upon, it will come upon everything that is there. So the sense that John is putting forth here is that there is this light that comes and it shines on all of humanity. And once humanity has seen that light, there is a decision that needs to be made. There is a separation and a partition that is created. And that partition is this, that either we will be in the light and the force will be uh, shown to us, we'll make a decision to go along with it or we will reject it and flee from it and want the hiddenness and the darkness that's within to remain hidden, to remain unexposed. While light is given to every person, not all will choose to receive the light. But here's the great news, church, that when that baby came in the manger, 
when it wasn't just a child, but God who existed before time itself. When he stepped into that place, his light shined forth, and because of that moment, at that point in time, he became the light in the world that says, I am here for everyone. I will expose and shine myself upon all people. Every group, every tribe, every person is included in, 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 in the scope of who I came for. And I give an invitation to everyone. Have you ever been the victim of an insider's club? or the click, and you didn't fit in. You know, whether in high school or at work, at the water cooler, whatever it might be, there's a group of people who are on the in crowd, but then there's a group of people who are on the outs. There's a group of people who are not. Uh, I've seen the show Survivor, and they always have on that show someone that they're going to vote out every, every, you know, couple of challenges or so, right? And there's always people who are on the bottom, Those are the people who are not part of the alliance, not part of the in crowd, not part of the group that has access to to the blessing and the benefit of moving forward and experiencing the reward and continuing to to be um, included and accepted and wanted. The good news is when that baby came in the manger, his light was a light that shined for everyone. And it said, you know what, that light is for me as well. And he has given me an invitation an opportunity to experience him and say, yes, Lord. Lastly, Emmanuel in the darkness, he's available. For this one who is true light, who gives light to everyone, was going to come into the world. And as we keep reading throughout this text and we get to verse 14, and the word became flesh and he dwelt among us. He made his dwelling among us. This refers to the incarnation of Jesus. The baby came. He stepped into humanity. God did not just stay in heaven and say, let me grab my flashlight and let me shine this light on every single person from up here. No, he said, let me step down and say, hi, I'm God. I'm here. Emmanuel. Jesus came from heaven into earth to this darkness, leaving heaven, bypassing galaxies, finding this one little blue-green tan globe called earth. He touched down in the backwaters of the Roman government and empire into this little town of Bethlehem that was rejected, one of the lowliest of all tribes and towns. And into the womb of a virgin, he stepped in. He walked about it. Think about it. He walked into the situation. Nothing about it is normal and ordinary. Philip Yancey writes this. He said, One night in the cold, in the dark among the wrinkled hills of Bethlehem, God, who knows no before or after, entered time and space. God, who knows no boundaries, took on the shocking confines of a baby's skin and the ominous restraints of mortality. Why did he come, church? Why did he come? And for us, two pertinent reasons this morning. And this is the main point of why I wanted to share this message with you this morning. He came to show how dark it really is here without him. Number one. But then number two, you know, thank God that he's not just a God, uh, a child who came and then said some things, did some things, accomplished some things, just so he could say, you don't cut it. You don't measure up. I've exposed, I've shined, I sh- I've shown my light on you and showed you who you are. All that you could be, all that you could ever amass to be, all that you could ever ascribe to become. I've, sh- I've shown my light and that's all you are. Second reason he came was because he said, it is dark, but I can lead you through. So you can give God a praise for that. That it is dark, but I can lead you through. Mankind, before Jesus came, had a relative goodness. You know, we have this idea of comparing ourselves to each other. And we typically pick the most, you know, vile of people. And I don't know whose water this is, but I'm going to take it. And we compare ourselves to this person and that person. And we say, you know what, uh, I feel like I'm a better person than he is or she is. You know, I'm not as bad as they are. But when Jesus came, 
in his perfect life, and he did what he did, saying what he said, and suddenly that light was so perfect and so brilliant and so bright that when we stop and we look at his light and we say, you know what, yeah, not really. I- I'm nothing. I'm nothing in comparison to what he is. No way. He shows us all up, but he says, all right, now that I've shown you who you are, I've shown you who I am, now let me lead you through to who you can become. And he doesn't just put us in this, our place, but he takes our hands and leads us through. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. That implies the world is dark, that there is a challenge. But Jesus has come, and he tells us that we have hope. That's why on Christmas and Christmas Eve, in this season, we come together, we sing the songs we sing, we, we, we celebrate the things we celebrate, we get excited because we truly believe this, this is hope, that I not only am in the darkness, and that darkness ultimately is the darkness of sin, that I am lost without a Savior, that I am in need of salvation, that because of my ancestry, because of the separation that Adam and Eve brought upon this world, I would never be able to live in light, fully enlightened and experience the the pinnacle of what I was intended for, I need the light of Christ that has come and says, all right, throughout this mess and this darkness, throughout all the violence and all the issues and all the pain and all the sorrow and all the trials and tribulations, here you go, take my hand because I'm the God in the valley, I'm the God in the storm, and I'm the God in the darkness, and I dispel all the darkness around me. Amen? And so, church, I just want to share with you this last story. We'll, we'll conclude and, and give you an invitation this morning. Like I said, it's not anything mind-blowing or, 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 or super intellectually savvy, but here's the deal. It is spiritually impacting. It is spiritually the most important thing that we could ever encounter or experience is the light of the world that is Jesus Christ who came in that manger. There was... Um, there's this, this principle um, that sometimes we, we get caught up in, and we talked about it during the series. Life gets difficult, things get hard, and we often say, God, where are you? God, what's going on? Where have you been? When Jesus stepped into that manger, he proved a principle that God is not just an idea, not just a principle, not just a factor that we consider, but that he's a person. Jesus was not an idea of God, but he, he is not just the picture of God, but he is God himself in human form. Two young men were on a battlefield in World War II, and it made, they made it somehow miraculously to the foxhole that they were trying to get cover In the midst of enemy fire, they made it to this foxhole. And as they looked out before them across the battlefield, they perceived the horror of their surroundings. There were men mangled and disfigured. There was the horror of the dead and dying men, twisted barbed wire, the earth scarred and deep gouges and holes in the earth left by cannon fire, people lifeless on the ground, others crying for help. It was a terrible scene. Finally, one of the men cried out and he says, God, where are you? Where is God in this? And as they continued to watch and listen, they soon noticed two medics identified by the red crosses on their arms and their helmets upon their heads. And they carefully were making their way across this perilous scene as bullets are whizzing by. And they, they, these guys watched these medics step in and out, coming to the aid of the wounded and the sick and the dying. These medics stop and they began to load wounded soldiers here and there on their stretchers. And once they were loaded, they began to work their way back to safety. And as the scene unfolded before them and they're looking at this incredible display, the other soldier boldly stood up and he said to his friend, he says, honestly, he said, friend, there is God. There is God right there. God is right there. When Jesus became man and he came to show us that God is alive and well, that he's not just shouting his love from heaven, but that he is intimately here in the midst of our loneliness, in the midst of our sorrows, in the midst of our pain, in the midst of this world that's gone mad, yet in the chaos and confusion of it all, Jesus says, I am here. Not just as a baby, come and admire me cute and cuddly, but I am here, the savior of the world. 
I have come for you. I have said some things and done some things and fulfilled some things for you. And so in the midst of it all, I am here to help you. 2019 has been a, uh, 2020, sorry, has been an incredibly difficult and challenging year for many. Some of us have lost loved ones. Some of us have lost employment. Some of us have, you know, had dreams be shattered and, and situations, you know, happen to us that we would never have signed up for. Church world has been rocked and, and there's so much change that is happening all around us in every a- aspect and element of our, of our lives. But one thing remains true that in the midst of this all, Jesus is God with us, Emmanuel. And he is not just a baby in a manger, but when we stop and we gaze in the pain and the sorrow and the hurt within us, we can have this rock solid assurance that who is right here with us is not someone that will let us down, but is the God of all eternity, the God that stands beyond time, the one that called the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning, the one who has written every one of our names down and knows the length of our days before they ever were. He is God Emmanuel. He is the child in the manger, the man upon the cross, the one who rose from the grave and no longer inhabits a tomb, but he stands at the right hand of the Father, and he said to us, Behold, I am with you always. Why? Because I've sent you my Holy Spirit. So this morning, will you stand with me as we just get ready to, to close out our service here? If your faith and your hope is in Jesus Christ, the light will never go out. The light will never go out as life gets difficult and it gets rocky and rough. Family members get sick, relationships crumbles, opportunities are fumbled, people get in accidents, things happen, life will happen around us, but we have hope that the light has come. I want you to make an altar of where you're at this morning, and I want you to just worship and celebrate what Jesus has done. I want you to just celebrate what he is, eternal. Available, inclusive for you. And like I said, when his light shines, he brings an invitation. The invitation is that we have to decide am I going to step into that light and allow it to do its work within me and on me? Or am I going to choose to walk away from it, reject it, and stay in the shadows? The Bible tells us that when we say yes to the Lord and we receive them in our hearts and we say, Lord, we recognize that we are part of this world that is lost and broken. We ourselves may have gone through different, you know, pursuits in our lives trying to find that light and that enlightenment and, and all that we need to, to feel satisfied and fulfilled. We may have, you know, run to success and fame. We may have run to this religion or that religion. We may have run to this prophet or person or this teaching or that teaching and this thing or that thing, whatever it may be. Jesus is the true light, the light of the world. While other lights may seem to have a little bit of truth here and there and they might flicker for a moment, there has been no light throughout all of eternity that has never wavered like the light of Christ and his light it tells us that when he comes back and he takes us to that place which he has prepared which is the heavenly home in heaven there will be no other conflicting lights and no other shadows all that there will be will be the light of his glory the splendor of his greatness and that sufficient for us in that moment the promise he's given us today is if we say lord yes here i am i need your light in my life he's faithful to give it to us so this morning if you are in a place where you're going through a situation i don't know what it is you know things have just not worked out and you're looking forward to turning the page to 2021 even though there's still a lot of questions and ambiguity one thing i'll tell you the one who was before time who stepped into that manger is also outside of time and already sees our tomorrow 
And he's prepared for you an excellent, wonderful year. Maybe filled with trials and challenges, but he is there already making his way and making it possible because he will never fail you. If you need that Christ, if you need that hope, if you need him in your life today, I want you to just raise your hand. If you need another touch of God in your life this morning as we celebrate this Christmas service, I want you to just say, Lord, I need your light. I need you to shine your light in my marriage. I need you to shine your light, Lord God, in my family, my kids. I need you to shine your light, Lord God, in my employment and job. I need you to shine your light in my faith journey with you, God. Shine your light and take away the doubt, the fear, the, the insecurities. Take away, Lord God, the, the, the worries and the burdens that are there that are just not from you. If that's you, I want you to just raise your hand. We're going to pray together. And if you've never made a confession of faith and said, Jesus, I need you in my life because without you, I will remain in darkness forever. Eternal darkness without God, separated from him. If you need to say, Lord, I need you today, raise your hand. We want to pray with you as well. The team is going to minister one more time, and they're going to sing. This is your altar right here where you're at. Close your eyes. Forget about who's beside you and around you. Christmas is the miracle of God stepping into flesh for you to show you a way out of this darkness. Father, I pray for everyone that is here. That, Lord God, you would minister your truth, your hope, your life, the light of of the world, the light of life that leads all out of darkness. God, I pray that you would illuminate today what is needed. Father, that you would break the power of every sin and power, Lord God, of every lie. Break, Lord Jesus, the stronghold of every false light that is claiming dominance and authority over your children this morning. And Father, erect instead the light of the world, Jesus Christ, within their hearts. In your precious name.